So this is a really fun project. Uh, as Richard mentioned, this is, this is funded by uh, CERC, the Strategic Energy Alliance. Um, this is a cool project for a couple of reasons, one of which is that I get to work with uh, Michael Wara. He's um, Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment and a, and a lawyer by training uh, and, and sort of avocation. And so he thinks a lot about the regulatory and policy issues. And so this is a cool project where we get to interface between modelers, um, you know, um, uh, geeky lar large systems of equations, and the real kind of legal uh, policy regulatory economic questions that drive uh, utility decisions. Uh, uh, students and postdocs uh, have been working in this. Mo and Luke are working in it currently. Uh, the bulk of the technical work was done by my uh, fabulous former graduate student, Gregory Von Wald, um, uh, who did this uh, as a large part of his thesis work. Also collaborated with uh, folks from Los Alamos National Lab, Anatoly Zlotnik uh, and Karthik Sundar. Um, and they've been uh, helping a bunch with the project. So lots of folks involved. Um, OK, so like, why should we talk about gas in an increasingly renewable world? Obviously, the world is, is uh, moving towards renewables, and renewables are growing very quickly. But gas demand is still increasing. We need clean, uh, firm power generation. We want process heat without particulates in industrial regions. We want flexible backup for renewables. Uh, ideally, we'd have some redundant infrastructure. You know, Things like the Texas blackout, for example, uh, during that cold spell are good examples. Um, but how will we reconcile the need for gas system services with climate progress? Uh, and how much will electrification affect the demand for gas and uh, the need for gas distribution systems? So we've got this massive system here. These are intra and interstate pipelines um, across the United States. And we can see here uh, you know, this massive build out of a century or so of, of laying pipe in the ground. What are we going to do with this as electrification progresses? Is there a need for this? How much will we need? Uh, and what are we going to replace uh, natural gas with in the long run if we need to replace it? Uh, there's a lot of constraints facing uh, gas utility, both technical and regulatory factors. So on the technical side, you've got things like uh, energy supply has to meet demand while meeting uh, you know, concerns about physical safety, deliverability, system integrity. Okay. These are actually sort of operationalized in terms of composition, heating value, and contaminant standards. And often there's a whole uh, sort of nested set of overlapping standards that kind of intersect with each other. And then you know, those are sort of um, mediated uh, by this social layer, which is utilities are required to serve customers to meet needs while keeping costs contained and doing it safely. Right, And this is the, the, in, the, in the case of California, this is where the Public Utilities Commission steps in and says, you can or can't uh, invest in this infrastructure and recover those costs. Uh, and often, um, you know, what they can do is limited because of, of concerns about cost. As an example of like how these might um, intersect, this is a fun case study we did from a, a former paper of Greg. Uh, we modeled the local gas system in Hanford, California, which is, uh, we called it Cowtown because uh, it's in the Central Valley of California. There's probably more cows than humans. Uh, large dairy uh, systems, and so basically we put dairy um, uh, biogas digester injection points at uh, major dairies, and then we modeled in, for example, October versus January, what would the heating value of gas be uh, in the pipe system, right? And so by doing um, essentially mass balance on the nodes, we can track the compositional uh, makeup by node, and you see here that actually the heating value changes over the course of the year uh, as more or less gas demand from uh, as actually the intersection of gas demand plus gas supply from the digesters. So that's just an example of what you sort of might face in a high uh, renewable gas version uh, of the future. Um, so we, what you basically do is you, you uh, do statistical analysis to create representative days by selecting template days. And here each template day has kind of um, got a color, right? So that's the representative for that particular type of day. And then you use that to paint in, you know, if you had a color for each particular day, it would, you know, you'd need 365 shades. Each day is unique. What we instead do is say, okay, I'm going to paint in with the nearest day such that I only actually have to model, let's say, six, seven, eight days. We've tended to be able to solve with kind of a five uh, to ten day kind of time frame, and we'll talk about the computational effort involved. Um, but this is essentially done at each investment year. So in 2020, 2025, 
2030, et cetera, you go through and you model this uh, template year, or this, these template days uh, over the course of the, the modeled year. Importantly, we use constraints to link days. So for example, these are the weekend days here, uh, these different colors. So those actually the model statistically finds that weekend days are different, and so those are in a different color. Uh, what we can do, actually, we can track between days. And so, for example, if you have less electricity demand on the weekend, you can create hydrogen or a synthetic um, gas product, store that, and use that gas during the week. So we can track across days, um, essentially, the, the, the kind of uh, yield and amount and storage, both for batteries and gas. Uh, we do have um, power demand uh, constraints uh, at each node. So basically what you say is um, you know, local generation minus uh, what we ship out plus what we discharge essentially has to equal uh, demand uh, for consumption of power at the node and demand for production of, of uh, sin fuels at the node. Okay, is, is the way, this is the residual form of the constraint equation. You can move these two demand sides over. So this basically has to hold at each node. Uh, the gas flow constraints on the other are uh, similar uh, in a way. The flow is a function of squared pressure uh, between the two nodes. And so along a pipe, basically, the amount of flow is proportional to the squared pressure, modulated, of course, by the diameter of the pipe uh, and some other factors. And so we actually have a decision variable in units of, of differential squared pressure that we use. Um, and we're constrained to keep that within a min max. We can't have too large of a pressure gradient between two nodes. Okay. Uh, gas constraint, uh, let's see here. Uh, so this power balance is satisfied hourly. Now in reality, we know power has to balance instantaneously on the grid, but we use an hourly approximation of that. Uh, the gas system, on the other hand, uh, this only has to balance for each representative day. We could model this on an hourly basis, but that would increase our number of variables uh, fairly significantly. Um, let's see, 4.01 p.m. I mean, okay, so I'm about halfway done here. Um, okay, so we applied this to a template uh, electric gas system. So Anatoly and his coworkers at Los Alamos uh, built this system and, and published it in a 2016 paper. This combines an IEEE 24 bus sort of standard electric uh, network model. IEEE promulgates these sort of basic um, kind of vanilla scenarios. And so they have them at different levels of scale and fidelity. Uh, and folks who do electric system modeling will sort of model these, right? Say, so, okay, I modeled the IEEE standard 24 bus system. Uh, they then coupled that to this uh, 25 node gas system uh, with external sources of supply, uh, compression, power to gas, et cetera. Uh, we do have electricity storage, power to gas, uh, biomethane, et cetera, on there. And we do have linkages, for example, here, uh, this system here. Uh, takes uh, gas and, in, and injects it into this gas generator, which produces power. Oh, actually, uh, yeah, right there. Uh, similarly, J24 connects to this one right here, okay? So we have these two networks that are on top of each other, uh, and we need to satisfy demand for gas and power between them. Okay, computational challenges. Um, let's see here. Um, Gas flow is not, gas flow direction is not known a priori. So before you solve a particular uh, instance, in this case the gas flow is resolved daily, so a particular day, uh, you won't necessarily know which direction on my map the gas is going to flow. Okay, this makes the problem non-convex. Uh, what we do is we introduce what are called binary variables to indicate flow direction. So a one will be flow in one way, a zero will be flow in the other, uh, will be flow in the other direction. Okay. Uh, this can be useful because, for example, I think this is quite important. We may uh, face a future where in the summer, and let's use California as a case study, we have significant excess generation of electricity in the south. Okay. Uh, in the winter, we may have significant excess electricity demand in the north. Right. And then and those aren't necessarily the same seasonally, right? So those, those sort of uh, directional shifts required in energy may differ with the season. So ideally, you could flip these and say, okay, if I'm modeling a winter day, for example, I could have the gas flowing in one direction. If I'm modeling a summer day, the gas may flow in another direction, okay? 
because there may be a need to adjust these because we're basically harvesting resources that are more uh, va variable spatio uh, in a spatiotemporal sense. Uh, if I fix the flow direction, say I'm going to uh, predetermine which way the gas is going to flow and only allow it to flow in that direction, uh, our baseline model for modeling out to 2045 uh, will take 40 minutes with eight CPUs and 64 gigabytes of RAM. So that's a pretty typical laptop, nice laptop, but a laptop sort of scale, an hour, that's fine. Bidirectional never solved in pure form. We had to set a termination criteria to say, well, when you get within 1%, that's called an optimality gap, consider that good enough. And then it would finally solve in 14 hours with 128 core CPU and a terabyte of RAM. Okay, so this is computationally crazy uh, quite quickly. Uh, she set it to kill after 24 hours, so uh, before we set the termination uh, criteria, we, we never actually got it to solve with that bi bidirectional problem. So this can get pretty crazy. Thankfully, at Stanford, we have great computational resources, and so we can just call a, a big, they call it a big mem instance, which is, has this terabyte of RAM and, and 128 cores. Okay, so what are some baseline results? These are the peak week of demand for that same nodal structure, and we just transplanted it into two locations. We said mountain northwest, coastal Pacific. Okay, so we took that, pretended this same little city or, or region was just you know, sort of taken and plopped down in two different locations. And the northwest is peak, uh, uh, peak week. This is the week of peak demand is what we're plotting here, 168 hours. Uh, comes in the winter. Uh, and you see pretty significant, for example, natural gas combined cycle uh, loading. Uh, you can see the solar uh, profiles, et cetera. Uh, here's our peak week in the summer, uh, the coastal Pacific case. Again, a lot of natural gas, uh, solar, and wind. So these are the kinds of results you get. Negative here means we're basically consuming power, in this case, to make electrolytic hydrogen and storing into a lithium ion battery, or these uh, basically storing in there. Uh, you can see this shoulder effect here. Uh, that's basically storing out of the battery. So this uh, is storing into the battery. That's storing out of the battery. So that's what battery uh, sh load shifting looks like in this kind of model. We're also tracking with each investment time period the share of appliances. So this is really important when you're combining gas and electric systems. And this is something that we didn't, you know, this was year two or three of Greg's thesis before we realized, is that you're seeing a condensation of, you know, three years of very hard work from a very smart guy. Um, Greg's, one, you know, we get these students at Stanford where sometimes you're just like, yeah, okay, you're smarter than me. Go run, work on it, teach me. I really sharp guy, he, you know. So we're doing a lot of stuff in here. Um, and it's a monumental paper. I mean, the paper is just ridiculous. Um, Anyway, so we're tracking at the commercial sector and the residential sector, uh, basically on the um, cooling uh, spa and space heating uh, and then water heating. Uh, what are the shares of the uh, appliances? And so you can see here in Mountain Northwest, uh, by the mid 2030s or so, we've shifted entirely to electric heat pump water heating uh, from gas water heating, for example, to meet the target. Okay, so you can see these shifts in the appliance stock. It's tracking in each investment time period how many of each appliance type are there. We can do a lot of case studies. Um, oy vey. Um, uh, that, you know, that are of interest, we can look at things like gas quality constraints, look at shifts in appliances, um, you know, look at shifts in understanding. Here's gas quality limits. In this right uh, set of profiles, we have no uh, gas quality restrictions, and here we have uh, daily nodal gas quality restrictions. So this says every day at every node, you must satisfy all gas quality restrictions, which for example, in this case, I think is a 20% uh, molar blend wall on hydrogen. Okay, and so that says at every uh, node, at every day, you cannot exceed 20% hydrogen. Okay, this says no gas quality restrictions at all. Okay. So in this case, what you end up seeing is gas demand stays quite a bit higher here when we don't have those gas quality restrictions. This is annual gas uh, uh, usage or, or uh, generation. And in this case, where we have the gas quality restrictions by the later time period, we end up using maybe half as much gas. Okay. There are spatial effects of these gas quality limits. Oh, and then an in-between case, so no limits. This is annual limits. This says 
uh, over the whole network, over all the nodes, over the whole year, you can't exceed 20% hydrogen. So this is an important question we need to face when we're thinking about advanced gas grids is how sort of tight do we want to be on these constraints? Do I just need to say, well, I can't exceed 20% on average over the course of the year because it's a long-term degradation effect? Or is it an acute effect where I say, at no time can I exceed 20% in any location? Okay, and that's this nodal hydrogen limit. But you see here, when we go to no hydrogen limits, we get a lot of this bright green color, that's hydrogen generation. We get a lot more than over here uh, on the right. That node changes completely, right? And so limitations on the gas side actually affect geographically where things end up happening. Okay, and that'll affect the flows. Uh, what are the roles for appliance shifts? This is amazing. We just said, here, put in a constraint. If you have a gas furnace, you have to replace it with a gas, another gas furnace. You have a gas water heater, you have to replace it with another gas water heater. So we artificially limited the system in its ability to shift to an electric water heater or an electric heat pump. And so you see uh, pretty huge um, shifts to creating electromethane and electrolytic hydrogen in this case to satisfy that gas demand, whereas the same exact scenario uh, if we optimize for cost rather than forcing like appliance turnover, uh, then we, we get much less of that and a lot more use of batteries. Uh, oh, this, is, this just shows up in a lot more investment for electromethane if we do this persistence appliance case. Steady predictability, this one was kind of fun. As the model is currently stated, here's the policy target. It's followed in this paper that we published already. We'll open that up and explore it a little bit later. But we need to, in each of these years, 2020 to 2045, meet this policy target. We assume you know that in advance and it's certain. And you're planning and investing such that you know that. Well, as a utility operator, do you actually know that you're certain that these targets are gonna hold? What if you're myopic? And here myopic basically says, I know what the target is in this year, but I'm ignorant about what the target is gonna be in the future. I have no information. And so in that case, you get these shocks where instead of a steady uh, shift to heat pumps, you get these sort of shocks because you need to meet a certain target in a certain year and you didn't know ahead of time, right? So this is a work in progress. We're exploring the dynamics of, of this uh, sort of thing. Okay, so five or 10 minutes on a case study. <laughs> Three minutes on it, oh my Lord. Five more minutes, thank you, Richard, yeah. <laughs> a scholar and a gentleman you are, yeah, yeah. Um, so we're developing a, we, we promised in the proposal that we do three regional case studies with this. So rather than this toy IEEE bus, we're gonna do a Northeast, California, and an ERCOT. So basically we'll do three regional uh, kind of case studies. We're starting with the California model. We have 17 uh, building climate zones. We have the electric network of you know, all the uh, high voltage transmission. Uh, we have the gas, a large scale transmission gas network. Uh, we have zip code level demand um, uh, for electric and gas. Uh, we have power plant level uh, consumption from EIA Form 860 aggregated again to these. We're gonna end up with like 17 climate zones are gonna be our nodes. Uh, <laughs> amazingly, you know, we can get the power plants by nodes. So, so climate zone two here, that's all geothermal. That's the geysers power plant. Climate zone six is Los Angeles. Uh, coastal Los Angeles, it's all gas, right? So depending, this is the Mojave Desert, is all yellow, that's solar. So depending on the zone, we have a mix of existing generators. Uh, we can get demand side uh, variation by hour from this model called uh, res stock out of NREL. So for example, here's a 24 hour profile of gas demand uh, in 15 minute increments for a end use load profile for CEC, California Energy Commission building climate zone one. And amazingly, we know the shares of appliances in stocks because there's the residential appliance saturation study performed by the California Energy Commission, which was a very detailed survey to go into thousands of homes and say, okay, do you have a heater? If it's a heater, is it electric? Is it gas, et cetera? So we actually have a really good breakdown by climate zone. Um, so once we have this, and, and so basically we're building out a really detailed model for California where we're gonna be able to do this. I think there's a dozen, and this is where we, and we just basically, we just uh, got our first sort of tranche of money and we're just sort of starting to do this in the last uh, three to six months or so. But I think there's a dozen interesting questions and I'll just leave it here basically. Um, 
you know, what are the impacts of electrification incentives or subsidies? How much alternative gas can be blended while meeting constraints? We can do heating value constraints. We can do max hydrogen constraints. If you have a max hydrogen constraint, then maybe you need to make synthetic methane. Well, synthetic methane is thought to be more expensive, right? Can rules at the new build stage have material impacts? This is a huge, important policy question. A lot of the effort is focused on, well, if you're building a new home, you should electrify the new home. This is big efforts in California, Northeast Europe, other places. That's fine, and that sounds good, and it's very cost-effective, right? Because you don't need to pay for the gas hookup, right? You avoid all that infrastructure expansion, and you say, okay, I'm just going to go with an electric build. That makes a lot of sense. But I have real, real questions about whether that's going to do much uh, because of our, our low rate of, of housing turnover, okay? at least in California. What are the impacts of municipal level gas bans? So again, if you ban new gas hookups, what does that do? Uh, when is power to gas a cost-effective alternative to other forms of energy storage? Are we actually going to do that compared to batteries? In our base cases, we tend to do, do a fair amount of power to gas, power to hydrogen, and sometimes power to methane. But in what cases does that make sense? Are there equity impacts from the transition? So are we going to basically uh, you know, result in large economic shifts? And this is kind of a cool one. Can you know, sort of stage conversion or pruning of the gas system reduce costs while maintaining servability or serviceability, reliability, right? So can we say, OK, this region, for example, low demand, high fixed costs because we have a large amount of infrastructure, electrify that region, selectively prune the gas network. Is that kind of strategy cheaper than trying to maintain the whole system and electrifying sort of randomly piecemeal along the way? Okay, so this is a three-year project. We're just getting started. We're kind of six months in. A ton of super interesting questions. Uh, it's got the right mix of geeky and, and sort of interesting for me. Um, I'm, not in, I'm not inherently geeky. I don't, I don't geek out for the sake of it, but this has a lot of, I think, super uh, germane questions. So happy to take some questions. I, I'm pretty burned through my time, but uh, I can maybe take one. Or if Richard, if there's. Yeah, sure, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, Mike. So where does reliability and resiliency, how does that factor in with unknowns like transmission line shutdowns? Or yeah, so we, that's an excellent question. We don't have any of that in there right now. An interesting way to do that would be to essentially stochastically knock out during some representative days this power line and what happens, right? We don't have great resolution on kind of the physics of power flow. In order to really get at that, you'd probably want to do a real uh, AC power flow simulation, which is a tricky thing. Ours is a much simpler um, power flow kind of model. It's, a, it's basically a DC optimal power flow. And so um, I don't know that we could actually do that the way a electric system engineer would want to do that. What we could do, perhaps, is say, OK, here are some case studies to create that seem like they create pinch points in our model take them to a more sophisticated grid simulation tool and try to model just those few hours, right? Because this is hard enough to do with the very simple power flow physics, right? And so doing that at that more granular level would be super interesting. Right now, um, but yeah, we, we, we haven't done it right now. Basically, we just say demand has to be met in every hour, but we don't have any stochastic failure or offline um, you know, generators or, or you know, randomly offline power lines or anything like that. But that would be a very cool thing to do may have big advantages for keeping the gas system going, right, if you have these um, unknown stochastic failures of the electric grid. Yeah. 